I'll turn it over to you, Council Member Gaudier. Um, thank you so much, Alan, for that introduction. And good morning, everyone. Um, as an elected official, I do a lot of public speaking, but I feel like being here with Creative Mornings is a unique opportunity to interface with Philadelphia's creative community. And for that, um, I'm really grateful. Um, as Alan mentioned today, uh, the topic is, is home. And are we gonna put up my slide presentation? Okay, awesome. <laughs> as we mentioned today, the topic um, for this, this, this discussion is home. And as I sat down to think about what I wanted to share with you all this morning, I realized just how many different ways there are to explore the concept of, of what we call home. Um, home is about your roots, um, your hometown, your neighborhood, your block. Um, it's about shelter, um, a place where you can feel safe, um, an environment that's um, controlled and ideally a place to rest and recharge. Um, and it's about connection with family, with your friends, um, with your pets, uh, with yourself. And too often having this kind of home um, is a privilege. Um, maybe you can't afford a place to call your home, um, or maybe because of forces outside of your control, your neighborhood isn't a place where you regularly find solace and connection. Um, and this is a big part of what inspired me to run for office, which I'll get to a little later. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about what home has meant to me throughout my life. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that's me. <laughs> I was born in the district that I represent now in a neighborhood called King Sussing um, on a quintessential in the central Philly block. Um, when I was a kid, you know, we'd go outside and we'd play all day, you know, whether it was hot scotch or rope or um, street games, um, you know, we were constantly outside and connecting um, on our block. My dad was born and raised in Philly and my mom's family immigrated here from um, an island called St. Vincent in the Caribbean. And both of them had big families that were based in Southwest Philadelphia. So it felt like, um, you know, my family had a big presence in, in my neighborhood. And I grew up knowing that we were a little bit different, um, you know, because I came from, you know, on, on my mom's side, a family of immigrants, um, that, that felt different. I didn't know any other immigrants except my family um, and to people, you know, in my community, the food we ate was kind of weird. You know, my mom had an accent um, as well as my family, but for the most part, King Sussing was a very comfortable place for us. Um, both of my parents were in professional school when I was very young. You know, my dad was um, going to school or in law school and my mom was in the school. Um, my grandma and my aunt lived on the same block as us in, in King Sessing. Um, that's a picture. The picture on the right is um, of me and my one of my favorite aunts, um, Aunt Kathy, my, my father's sister. Um, and, you know, since my grandma and my aunt lived on the same block, they definitely stepped in to take care of me a lot um, during that period. So to me, as a kid, you know, my community really felt like an extension of my home and my family. And home was a familiar place um, with people um, whom I knew and loved very much. I went to my local neighborhood school, uh, Kamaji's Elementary, and I spent a lot of time at the King Sussing Rec Center and Library. And these places also felt like extensions of my home and places where I could learn and grow and connect with other kids in my community. We wound up moving out of King Sussing um, when I was around nine. Um, around that time, you know, um, the crack epidemic was hitting the city and many parts of the city, including King Sussing, started to get um, very dangerous. Um, we had a, a neighbor who struggled with addiction. Um, she broke into our house and threatened our family. Um, and at that point, you know, home began to feel like a place of conflict um, where many people were struggling in a variety of ways. And so we winded up moving to try to find um, a home that was safer. Um, we spent a couple of years in Center City, um, but eventually settled in Winfield, which 
is um, a middle class and working class black community in uh, West Philadelphia. And, and it was a lot st more stable than um, what we experienced in King Sessing. And so um, I lived in Winfield um, until I went off to college. My parents still live in Winfield. But even through all of that, you know, King Sussing has always felt like my home um, and the place where I'm from and the place where my family um, is from. Next slide. Um, now that I've given you a sense of what home was like growing up, um, we can fast forward a few years. Um, I eventually, you know, I winded up going to Temple um, for uh, undergrad, but I eventually went to Penn um, to study city planning um, as a graduate student. And I was attracted to this field because I've always felt, um, you know, like it was one that would give me the ability to work with people in communities to help create a sense of home, to, to create their sense of home. Um, and, you know, what I noticed when I went to planning school um, at Penn was that most of the people in this field um, are white. Um, and even if they aren't white, um, they're likely to not be from Philly. Um, and so a lot of times um, to me, planning felt like um, people who aren't from here making decisions for people who are from here. And I wanted to change that. Um, as someone who was born and raised in Philadelphia, um, I felt a duty and a responsibility to fight to amplify the voices and prioritize the perspectives of Black people in our neighborhoods. Um, next slide. Um, once I became a, an urban planner, um, I started off working for an organization called Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. And I got to see behind the curtain of how community and neighborhood development actually happens in this place that I've always called home. Um, I saw how government works with nonprofits and funders to invest in neighborhoods, um, in housing, and in um, our neighborhood commercial corridors. And it felt like this secret world opening up to me um, that I, I didn't know before, you know, how it how it operated. And for me, this work has always been about a drive to help um, the people who live here and particularly the people who are from here to carry out their vision for their communities. And that's also why I wanted to be um, a council member and a district council member in, in uh, particular. District council members in Philadelphia play a significant role in in zoning and land use and in land disposition, um, the things that really help to shape neighborhoods and create community. Um, I never, you know, I wanted to run for city council for a long time, I would say at least the last decade, but I never wanted to be um, an at large um, council member. Being um, a district council member and particularly the, the council member for the third district was attractive to me because of the role that I get to play in, in helping people to create a sense of home, to create their sense of home. Um, next slide. And so fast forward again, <laughs> um, many years um, through my campaign and through getting elected and now you know we're in City Hall. Um, and it was so incredibly exciting to take on this role and to be in City Hall and in council chambers every day. And then it was incredibly jarring to get sent home just two months into it um, later because of the, the COVID shutdown. And as we all know, when COVID hit, um, home became, became the 24 hours per day backdrop of our lives. Um, and being a new council member in this context was um, an unbelievable challenge. I was trying to build relationships with my colleagues virtually, um, while also sharing space with my two teenage sons um, who were doing virtual learning um, and who were tapping into the same resources I was, whether we're talking about physical space, Wi-Fi, or like the snacks that we have at home. <laughs> um, next slide. A big part of the job of a district council member is constituent services. Um, and the stay at home order um, meant having to interface with our community members, many of whom are not um, technologically inclined in a whole new way to make sure that they were safe. Um, Based on the kinds of concerns that residents were bringing to us, um, my team um, had a front row seat to the ways that the pandemic upset the ways that we think about home. 
um, communities, um, or particularly black and brown communities that have always been disinvested became much less hospitable during the pandemic. Um, when people weren't able to go to school or to church or to their rec centers, um, to all of the places where they were accustomed to going to get the support and services that they need, it was really hard for people and it made our communities feel less nurturing. Um, and for me, as a public official during this crisis, I felt and I continue to feel a massive sense of duty to protect my home and my community and to make sure that people are safe um, and that they're well. And more than anything, this is what has defined my agenda um, and my advocacy um, over the last year and a half. Next slide. Um, from a policy standpoint, this is what motivated my work to introduce and pass the Emergency Housing Protection Act, um, which quite literally kept vulnerable Philadelphians in their homes, um, protecting them against eviction um, during the scariest, most unpredictable part of the COVID pandemic. Um, this sense of duty also um, to protect my home um, also led me to places like Clark Park, where our community held a counter rally um, to what was expected to be an unwelcome demonstration from a, a white supremacist a white supremacist group called the Proud Boys. And in that moment, um, I was, for lack of a better word, um, proud um, to stand with my community um, and to come together as a united force um, to let you know these alt-right instigators know that they were not welcome um, here in our home. And as a mom, I also felt a sense of responsibility to protect not just my kids, but kids all over um, our district. Um, I want them to get home safe um, at the end of, of each day. And I want our collective home um, here in West and Southwest Philadelphia to be a peaceful and nurturing place where people can thrive. Um, and this has also sparked a lot of my policy work recently. I mentioned the Emergency Housing Protection Act um, before, and we're also working on a couple of other big housing measures now that aim to keep our neighborhoods affordable and to keep land in our community's hands. Um, the Mixed Income Neighborhoods Bill, which I introduced with my colleague, um, Councilmember Quinona Sanchez, a few months ago, would require that affordable units be part of any big construction project in certain parts of our district. Um, we calculated that if this legislation had been in place three years ago, um, there would be between um, 250 and 500 additional affordable apartments available to low income residents of our district. Um, and so we're pushing hard for this bill because we don't think that we can leave whether our neighborhoods are affordable to the whim of developers. We have to use policy um, to force this issue um, and protect our people from displacement. I'm also working on a bill that <clears throat> I'm expecting to introduce in the fall that would promote community land trust. Um, we're hoping to provide grassroots organizations um, with a leg up in the competition for city owned vacant land for purposes that are beneficial for our communities like um, affordable housing, permanently affordable housing and community gardens. Next slide. And sadly, when it comes to providing a safe place for our youth and everyone who lives in West and Southwest Philly to call home, we can't have this conversation without talking about gun violence, which has um, become my primary focus over the last year. And this isn't how I expected to focus my work. Um, you know, as I told you all, I'm an urban planner, but considering the, the tragic toll that this epidemic has taken on my district and what the day-to-day -day reality has become for my constituents over the last year, in my eyes, there's no way we can create this idea of home for people without tackling gun violence um, head on. Um, Philly has um, currently the highest numbers of uh, the highest number of shootings and murders per capita of any big 
city in the entire country. And it's our black and brown neighborhoods that are bearing the brunt of this violence, many of whom, uh, many of which are in my district. And so I've been sounding the alarm bells with the mayor um, and his administration and with our city as a whole that this is our home, but people don't feel safe here. Um, and that's an injustice that we can't tolerate. And as elected leaders, it's absolutely our responsibility to step up um, and to fix that. Um, over the last year, it's been really important for me to show up for our community members um, when they're not safe, right? And to show them that I'm there with them um, and that I'm working hard to change the situation. And, and whether that means showing up at you know scenes of violence in my community, showing up at um, rallies and 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 protests um, to stand beside my community. Um, this has been a really important aspect of being you know showing my constituents that I'm there with them um, and and representing our home. Um, we're all looking forward to a day when we can put um, this dark period of our city behind us. But until then. I'll continue to put pressure um, on the mayor and all city leaders to escalate our response to um, gun violence until we can restore peace and calm um, to our streets. Next slide. And I can go on and on about this topic, but I know that we're gonna have a conversation after this. Um, and in closing, I just like to say that it's such a privilege to get to do this work every day and to work towards um, a future where everyone has um, a comfortable and healthy, healthy place to call home. So thank you so much for having this, me this morning. And with that, um, I'll open up for any questions or comments that you may have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jamie. What an inspiring overview of all the super important things you're, you're engaged uh, in for our city. Uh, my very first question um, is, what was that a picture of? That last picture, that looked very cool. And while Jamie's <laughs> answering, I want to invite other people to either type questions into the chat, or you can raise your hand, um, and we'll call on you. That was a picture of a cleanup that I did with your fave trash man, who was like, who, who has become like a really important activist on the issue of trash and making sure that our community members have clean places to call home because that's what what they deserve. <laughs> your fave trash man, very cool. <laughs> um, that's terrific, and I I know he's spearheading all kinds of cleanup events like that. Yeah, it is. As soon as it's not 100 degrees out, I will go do one of those cleanup events. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if there's some, oh, some some love for your fave trash man is coming in. <laughs> what are some other questions? You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you just want to hop in and ask. Hi, Jamie. Orly here. So nice to see you. It's been, what, 10 years since a long time. Good to see you, Orly. <laughs> I've been following you, you know, since uh, for a long time, but one of the things that, that I've been curious about is how are you working with the mayor and the mayor's office to, um, to address gun violence? Because, you know, it, it's, I mean, I know what a complex issue, well, I don't know personally, but yes, it's a very complex issue, but without getting gun control laws passed, what can be done? Sure. I mean, obviously, we have to decrease the supply of guns on their, our streets. There are just way too many guns, right? But Philadelphia, um, the state has preempted our ability to do that. And we're currently suing the state over that. And that's going to be, you know, a process. We need the cooperation state and the federal government in order to pass um, more substantial gun control that can help um, with, with getting guns off of our streets. However, I, I continue to believe that as a city, we can have a local strategy that, that impacts this. And so, um, you know, my call has been for um, more of an emergency response that directs um, the resources of our city towards the people and the neighborhoods um, really experiencing this gun violence. 
violence. Um, about a year ago, I put forward a resolution calling on the mayor to declare gun violence a citywide emergency. Um, and in that resolution, I asked for a number of things. Um, one, I think that every city agency in this uh, in Philadelphia should have gun violence as their um, number one priority um, and direct their resources um, accordingly. I think that as a city, we should also be drawing on the private sector. We have a dynamic business um, community. We have um, world-class um, institutions that can help us to put resources um, and knowledge towards this issue. I think that residents deserve more transparency um, on what the city is doing. Um, as I would go around to different um, you know, neighborhoods where shootings have occurred, my, the residents would profess they have no idea what the city is doing to deal with this issue. I think that's an injustice. Um, and I also think that we should be searching for um, the best solutions, evidence that have worked in other places to reduce um, gun violence. Um, the mayor formally declined maybe like two weeks ago to declare the emergency after like a year of advocacy. Um, and so now my stance is, okay, fine, don't call an emergency, <laughs> but create an emergency response, right? Um, the mayor should be meeting with all of the top, um, his agency heads every day on solving this issue. Parks and Rec should be working in impacted neighborhoods to, um, um, to have rec centers open with robust programming um, for as many hours as possible. Um, the Commerce Department um, has $5.6 million from this, from uh, that council allocated for workforce development, for people who are most likely to shoot and get shot. They need to develop that programming so that we can offer people meaningful jobs. Um, we should be expanding crisis intervention. So that's our program where we have folks with lived experiences in our neighborhoods trying to mediate between um, young people and stop conflicts before they turn into violence. The health department should be on board to make sure that we have trauma services all over um, these neighborhoods that experience constant shooting so that we can help people to heal um, and also stop retaliatory shootings. That's the kind of response that we need in this moment um, to prevent. And my, my push has always been about um, prevention and intervention because um, enforcement is happens afterwards. Enforcement happens after the bodies drop. We need to invest in the things that can stop people from picking up guns in the first place. And so that's my push. And I will also say that I work during the budget season to demand um, a historic investment in um, gun violence uh, prevention and intervention. We demanded $100 million um, in the mayor's budget. We didn't get the 100, but we got the 70 million. And $20 million of that money will go directly to grassroots organizations with the credibility and the trust to work in our neighborhoods to help bring down the violence. And so you're right to point to gun control, but we can't rest there. We can absolutely use the resources of our city locally in a better way um, to address this issue and keep people safe. Hi, Jamie, this is Lisa. Hi. I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak, hi. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the intersection between zoning and some zoning initiatives and violence. Um, I loved watching recently the movie Concrete Cowboys, which obviously it's a movie, it's fictionalized, but it's based on some real stories of Philadelphia. And it you know, shows how there's kind of these community networks that maybe sometimes get disrupted by gentrification, by some zoning issues. So I'm wondering if how you see the, the two kind of um, working together? Huh, that's an interesting, interesting question. So one, I think something plays into housing affordability right? And whether, and, and, and people getting displaced from their, their community. Um, and so if we have a zoning policy that doesn't force this issue of affordable housing, then people um, might be displaced to other neighborhoods that they're unfamiliar with, um, which can also lead to community violence. Um, I think that, um, and that, and that's a big reason why I'm pushing for mandatory inclusionary zoning, right? So that people who live in West and Southwest Philly can stay here um, and, and not be displaced. Um, I also think that zoning can play a role in, you know, how we, whether we have like green spaces, whether we have um, um, healthy food, you know, opportunities for healthy food to grow um, in our community. So um, 
to the extent that people have whole healthy communities, I think that brings down um, gun violence in our in our neighborhoods. Um, and so I, I think zoning absolutely plays um, a, a key role in it. Hi, uh, hi, Jamie. <laughs> I had a question um, um, regarding um, some of the community groups here in Philadelphia that are doing anti-violence work um, and uh, anti-gun work. Um, I know there's been talk about funding some of these grassroots organizations. Um, in your recent work as a council member or just in general, you know, what are some good models that work here in Philadelphia or anywhere else? Sure. Um, there are um, a number of groups doing really good work. Um, here in my district, there's a group called EF Philly that I just talk about whenever I can because I love the work so much. Um, they have built, um, you know, they're two social workers, Kendra and James, who started their own organization and they have built trusted relationships with kids that have been involved in community violence or kids that are at risk for being involved in um, community violence, and they've created um, a safe space um, for these youth to come together um, to share any concerns that they have. Um, they connect these youth to services, to job opportunities. Um, those are those are the they're the type of organization that keep youth away from violence. Um, there's a group called I Day um, that works in Southwest Philly and South Philly. Um, they too um, are run by people with lived experience um, who know communities, who can identify um, people who are at risk or who have been involved in violence, and they work with them to uh, give them jobs, you know, clearing um, vacant lots and doing other um, work. They've been very successful at that. Uh, and then I, I would also list a group named Amir, Every Murder is Real. Um, they provide um, trauma services and relocation services, which I think is incredibly important. Um, you know, when violence is happening again and again and again in your community, it is traumatic for the victims and their families, but it's also traumatic for the people who live there, right, and who live in that environment. And Amir is providing a valuable service um, in helping people to heal, but also helping them, helping to tamp down retaliatory violence um, as they help people get um, healthier. So those are um, three examples, but they're literally organizations across our city who have been doing this work um, on shoestring budgets, um, and we need to support them more because their work matters. Well, thank you. I was going to ask a, a really naive question, um, and I don't know, is there any opportunity to um, speak to or has anyone spoken to the um, perpetrators of gun violence um, to talk to them and find out what, what led them to that particular day or moment um, when they um, express themselves that way? Yeah, some of the... the you know, the groups that I mentioned are working people that are sort of um, directly involved and also um, are many times um, staffed by people who have, you know, backgrounds where they might have been um, involved in, in activity as a younger um, person. And so that's why it's so important that those are the folks we have at the, at the table. We also... Mm -hmm has a program called Community um, Crisis Intervention um, Program, or CCIP, and that's where we use um, credible messengers, so folks who might have been involved in this activity in the past, um, to be out in our communities doing outreach to young people, um, mentoring them, helping to set them on a better path, um, and also helping to calm down conflicts and interrupt violence before it turns into shooting. So you're spot on that um, our effective solutions have to um, engage um, and be driven um, by people who are directly impacted and involved. Right. And I, I think I read just recently that more money is going to be going to or available for some of those smaller grassroots organizations that have sort of been shut out of the larger funds. How is that coming together? And I know the city has to put um, systems in place to, um, you know, make sure everything's, uh, you know, working and getting the impact that they need. 
Yeah, so that's a part of, so during the budget season, um, several council members, including myself, got together to demand a a historic investment in gun violence prevention. And we were able to win $70 million in new investment in this area. $20 million will go out to the the organizations um, that you mentioned. Um, So we're still putting in place like a process for that. But the other day, um, the council president and the mayor um, announced some of what will happen. So there'll be a monitoring group of which um, I'll be a part of um, with a few other uh, council members and people from the administration um, that will help to decide how that money gets out the door. And the city also will release next week um, an RFP for a fiduciary organization to manage those funds, uh, get the money out the door, and also for a, a, an organization to do capacity building with the grassroots organizations that we want to support. So still in process, but I don't know, my push has been faster, 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 and it will continue to be. <laughs> yeah, you keep pushing. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. I, have, I have another question. Is that, is that okay? Um, um, just um, going back to the, the theme of home, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the night you won the election and, you know, what, what it felt like to, well, it's a two-part question. The night you won the question, what it felt like to representing your, your home district. And then secondly, your, your new, uh, a new politician. So what did it, what did it feel like um, being a new politician where, you know, Uh, To be honest, you know, a lot of people serve in these roles for 20, 30 years, so there's not a lot of new blood. So just two questions. Um, Winning the election felt surreal. Like, you know, we worked hard. Like, I, you know, he worked really hard during the campaign. Um, Every day I'd be out knocking doors, talking to um, residents all over the district about what they wanted to see. Every day I was raising money um, to support my campaign. Like I worked so hard that I felt like I literally was like gonna have a nervous breakdown maybe if this campaign went on any longer, right? It was just like that intense. Um, But coming into election day, I felt like we were either going to lose by a little bit or win by a little bit and I wasn't entirely sure which way that was going to go and so like on election night I was literally um you know I was at home with my with my boys and I'm like just refreshing the computer (laughs) (laughs) and every for some reason we were the last district um to come in like the results to come in so oh wow else was coming in and accept the third district um and we were ahead from the beginning but I just thought well well, she'll she'll catch up or whatever right um but it was amazing to win like you know by a lot like we won by 12 percentage points um and over 3,000 votes um I just didn't expect that at all it was amazing and and surreal I can't even describe to you how how it felt. Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to recreate, you know, that that moment. <laughs> um, but so thank you. Um, and then um, being a new council member, you know, it's tough because um, I'm not only a new council member, I'm a council member that doesn't come from the traditional systems that, that council members come from, right? I wasn't a part, I'm not a word leader, I'm not a committee person, um, I'm not an official part of the Democratic Party, I, I wasn't somebody's political protege. Um, I was a person doing community and economic development um, that that jumped into to politics and um, you know, that makes my job a little harder sometimes, but it also makes me to be, that it also, I think, lends to me being more independent. Um, I say what I think is right. <laughs> um, and and I'm, I'm very, I have a lot of conviction about the things that I think need to happen um, for my district um, and for my, my people, um, but sometimes it's hard. <laughs> um, and I've tried to do my best to build, you know, relationships um, with my colleagues, but that's also been, um, been hard um, in a virtual setting. But I think, you know, over the past year and a half, I think we've been able to um, 
a lot to get our message out and to build, you know, relationships. Like I have my, my, my crew, right. That I roll with. Like a lot of people know that um, I'm really close to council member Gamble and council member Brooks. And we do a lot of stuff together, but I've been able to, you know, forge partnerships with other folks. Like I'm working with council member Quinones Sanchez on mandatory inclusionary zoning and on another um, affordable housing piece. Um, I've worked a lot with council member Hinata Johnson on gun violence. Right. And so I've been able to forge these partnerships that I think um, has worked and, and I've been able to get my, my message out. So we're, we're learning, <laughs> even within a hard system. Thank you. Could I ask another question? Um, you are working in such um, a dynamic, uh, dark, difficult space on issues of life and death in the city. Um, and you're moving fast, fast, fast. You're extremely dynamic and productive. What is, how do you renew yourself? Where do you find the space? Um, where do you go to, to generate what it is you need internally to do what you do out in the community? I mean, I will say it's hard. <laughs> um, this is hard work. Uh Sometimes it feels heavy, like the issues and, you know, there's a, this immense responsibility that you feel to, to solve these problems. So it, that can get hard. Um, but, you know, I try to, I try to run every morning. Um, that really helps me um, mentally. I try to take walks um, during the day. Um, I plug into my family, you know, my boys, as well as um, my parents and my sister and other family members. Um, I have, you know, key friends that I talk to um, about, you know, what's going on professionally and, and in my life and that helps. Um, Sometimes I just have to like be alone. <laughs> um, I, I mean, that's really um, an, an important part of me recharging. Um, and so those are all of the things that I try to, to employ, but it is hard. <laughs> Thank you. So a question came into the chat about the theme of home. And uh, Serena asks, when you host friends or family visiting Philly, where do, you, uh, where do you like to take them to introduce your hometown? Pretend there's no pandemic. So, you know, any favorite places, uh, art spaces, restaurants, parks, et cetera? Great question. Thank you, Serena. Um, I would say some of my favorite spots that I like to share with other people. I love parks. I love Clark Park. I love Malcolm X Park. Those are like two of my favorite um, hangouts. Um, I love um, different restaurants in my area. I love Booker's, um, Abyssinia. Um, let's see, um, a number, any number of great restaurants um, in West Philadelphia. Um, I used to, you know, oh, oh, the jerk hut was, uh, you know, one of my favorite haunts. Um, those are, those are some places I like to eat a lot. So that's, <laughs> I like to, um, I like to eat a lot and I like to be um, outdoors. So those are things that I probably show um, to other people. But I mean, I'm not, I will also say that I'm not the personality that's like the host. <laughs> but if I did have um, people come, those are probably some places I'd show them. I have a question to follow up on that, which is in being a council person, have you discovered new aspects of your home, this broader home of West Philadelphia? And have there been surprises, things you didn't know before that you've learned about um, that make to make this more of a home for other people? Um, I, it's definitely given me an opportunity to see and to learn, you know, parts of the district better than I knew them before. Like I'm from, um, you know, I'm from my district. So, and, and when I was at LISP, for example, I was the program officer for West Philadelphia and I supported a lot of um, work in West Philly, but being a district council member is different because, you know, you're always um, visiting um, 
events or community, um, you know, initiatives and talking to your constituents in different areas, helping to support different neighborhood projects. So you develop a much more intimate understanding um, of, of place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's been something that's been like really cool um, at for as in terms of being the district council member um, here in West and Southwest Philadelphia and something that I continue to look forward to doing, right? To, to um, expand this sense of, of home um, and what the, and, and my knowledge of, of my home. I have a, a question, um, uh, Jamie. I, would you be able to share, I'm thinking, you know, you've met so many people um, and, and I, you know, I'm always, I'm always just so amazed by how much you do in a day, but, um, I'm just curious if you could share a story, like one of your favorite stories about one of your constituents and something that really moved you. Uh, I would love to hear that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite stories about um a constituent i mean i might need to think for a second i'm sorry um because i i um also because i don't want to share sad stories i want to find something that's like happy um to share with you guys um it can actually be a sad story if you feel like that's the most meaningful thing to share i you know i don't think we need to be entertained at least speaking for myself Okay. Let's see. I mean, I want to find something. Uh, I would like to find something um, hopeful. Um, um, well, let's see. Okay. I'll tell you a, a, of an experience um, yesterday. That was pretty cool. Um, I yesterday went to visit um, this space called Mellon Park um, in, in Mantua. And it was actually, so when I was at LISC, I was a West Philadelphia program officer and I got to do a lot of work in Mantua. And I got to participate in this neighborhood planning process called We Are Mantua, um, where we were like, re-envisioning right the whole neighborhood and trying to and, and working to empower the community to achieve this vision and out of this planning process um grew the mantua civic association which is now you know a really strong neighborhood civic um and this great vision for the community and yesterday they invited me to visit like this this um park and they call it a um a park in a truck because they like literally um put it together themselves and it was on a vacant lot where there had been a lot of drug activity and negative activity. And I got to visit um, this park that was actually an outgrowth of um, a planning process that I was deeply involved in. And I also got to see the transformation um, that they made on this block. And so not only was this beautiful park there um, that was um, that the community built themselves with their own hands and, and they're now engaging youth um, in the ongoing upkeep um, of this park. Um, there was new affordable housing um, in this space. And so it was just a powerful example for me of how a community vision um, can come to life and, 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 and can come to life through the hands of the people um, who live there who and who care about that community. And that's what I think we need all over Philadelphia, right? In too many neighborhoods, we have people who feel like their communities are just happening to them um, and that's wrong. Um, so that was really special for me to see this that this whole thing had come to life um, in such a positive way. Thank you, Jamie. I have sure. another question too, which is um, you have your um, district encompasses at least three, I'm not sure if St. Joe's is in your district, maybe four, univer three universities who are very active in redeveloping the neighborhoods around them. How are you working with them? How are you ensuring that um, this idea of home and um, keeping people in stabilized communities is protected and how are you working with them to actually support your agenda as opposed to conflict with it? I would say that we, um, you know, my district has the 
distinction of being um, the district with the most um, educational and medical institutions. And that makes us um, a district with a lot of assets, right? We're a job center, not just even for um, this neighborhood, but for the city and the region. Um, we are a place where people want to come and live, right, and work. We're a place where that's hot for development. And so all of those are good things, but only if they benefit the people who live here. At the same time that we have all those assets, we have 35% of people living in poverty pre-pandemic. We have affordable housing that's disappearing, right? Um, we have huge health disparities. We have gun violence, right? And so my whole agenda is about making sure that there's equity and that all of the people who live here can benefit from those assets. And that's made for, you know, a complicated relationship with um, the institutions because I'm always pushing them to do um, more <laughs> um, because I think they have um, a responsibility, not just as citizens of this neighborhood, but as institutions that um, were built on top of Black neighborhoods and, and were, you know, the cause of pe Black people losing their wealth. So there is a historical responsibility and there is a current responsibility. <laughs> and, and, um, and I've been trying to forge a relationship um, with them that is centered on creating more more equity. And I think we're growing to, to know and, and, and respect each other and understand each other's uh, agenda, but I'm always the one that's like pushing. <laughs> so every time a, a project comes my way, um, I'm pushing for maximum community benefit. Um, I'm pushing for um, the offset of what I know could be negative impacts and making sure um, that there are, are clear positive um, impacts that our, my community members can, can benefit from. Um, and so it's been sort of a day by day, you know, growth of, of the relationship. And I have some, you know, great partnerships. And I would name, for example, Kevin Mahoney, who le leads Penn Health, um, has been an amazing partner um, and, and always open to my ideas and the things that I'm pushing for. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, and Jamie, you've been so generous with your time and energy and ideas this morning. Do we have time for one or two more questions, if there are one or two more questions? Sure, yeah. Okay. If you've been sitting on a question, now's your big moment. Oh, Rose had a question. Hey, Rose, go ahead. I've unmuted you. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> Sorry for my cold, everybody. I really didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you to Jamie. It was such a great honor to listen to her this morning and just to just to hear her enthusiasm and love for the city. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Looks like Orly has one more question. Go ahead and then we'll uh, end there. I just, you know, um, cause I, cause I was associated with Drexel for a while and I know their plans, you know, their, their big plan to expand into the area around 30th street station. And I just wondered if you are at all involved with that, if you're able to impact at all the decisions that are made so that, um, some, you know, some of these amazing initiatives that you talk about that they are also taken into account. Yeah. So typically, um, you know, the institutions have to come to us for zoning relief um, for, you know, sort of physical things that they want to do physically in the district. So um, we kind of use those conversations as a way to put for a maximum community benefit. But even when they don't use zoning relief, we're always sort of um, pushing for community benefit agreements or um, other means of making sure that uh, community members are really at the table um, and will get, you know, access and, and, and benefit from what happens. Thank you. All right. It looks like we have not one more question, but we have a final comment from Loris. So Loris, take it away. Hi, Jamie. Um, real quick, I, I wanted to tell you about a moment I had during the pandemic. Um, I was watching Instagram live with my family and I think you were <clears throat> you were being filmed I think at 52nd Street when there was some protests happening 
And it was this moment, I was watching with my family, with my 12 year old son. And it was this moment of like pure vulnerability and empathy and strength where you went and you actually talked to the people that were protesting. And it was so refreshing to see because I haven't seen a politician really just go in like that openly and talk to people. And it was just really impressive to see. And I, I imagine it was probably a very difficult time for you to confront that. But I, I just hope um, that spirit like stays with you. Thank you so much. Um, that was like a really scary moment. Um, I had been on the corridor earlier that day when there were tanks and like tear gas. And um, it, in that moment, I wanted those kids to get home safely. And I was very, very scared. Um, and, um, but, but, but it was really important to be there. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much for your time, Jamie. This has been a wonderful Creative Mornings talk. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next month. And if you would like to re-listen, we put every talk on our Creative Mornings PHL page uh, as you know the video. So you can listen again and get inspired over and over. Thank, Thank you. you so having me this has been great and enjoy your your day everyone thanks jamie take care thank you jamie bye bye, bye. thank you jamie thanks everyone